Until the end, Jim Foley's parents never gave up hope he would return safely. But this morning, that hope has turned to grief and to pride. In a message posted overnight on Facebook, his mother Diane said, We have never been prouder of our son Jim. He gave his life trying to expose the world to the suffering of the Syrian people. This is a tragedy which is beyond imagining. There were no words to describe this kind of inhumanity. Foley disappeared in northern Syria about 21 months ago on assignment for Global Post, covering, ironically, the brutality of the Syrian government against the rebels. These were clearly army positions throwing shells and heavy mortars into this, the heavy civilian population. In the chilling video posted online Tuesday, the 40-year-old photojournalist Foley is forced to kneel and is clearly coerced but still shows great dignity and courage. We have now witnessed the first act of war directly against America launched by ISIS. Though they may be at the moment on the other side of the world, they have America in their sights. And the beheading of an American journalist could have been expected once American bombs began to kill their believers. Now, the United States needs a new battle plan. Iraq remains a complete disaster, and new questions arise every single day. Let's get some answers. Welcome back to Midpoint, former veteran member of the CIA clandestine service, CIA station chief, and someone who knows Iraq intimately. Gary Bernson joins us. Gary, thanks so much for being here. Pleasure to be with you today. Gary, I would imagine that all the times we have talked, all the times that we have prepared and gotten ready for what is going on against ISIS, that you and those who are involved in the intelligence community are not shocked in the least, not only at what we have seen against an American journalist, but the brutality that has been shown to the world. Of course, you know, this is sort of traditional Al Qaeda slash ISIS playbook. But I will say that some interesting things are occurring in the region. I'm in Dubai today, and today it was announced that this authority in Arabia, and that's the Grand Mufti Sheikh Abdulaziz Al Sheikh, came out and stated that Al Qaeda and ISIS are Islam's enemy number one, which is fascinating. That the senior most religious authority in Saudi Arabia is encouraging his government to make war on them. That's the first point. Second point today that was very interesting is the German foreign minister came out and accused the government of Qatar, which is a U.S. ally, which we have, you know, our, our, our Ford CENTCOM base is, on, is IUD'd, IUD'd, is on their territory, of and, and the Germans have accused Al of the Qataris of funding ISIS. These are very, very interesting developments, but it looks like we're getting some support here out in the GCC in terms of Saudi Arabia and some of the other countries possibly pulling together with the Iraqis against ISIS. Gary, why then with so many years here, so much history of countries that you just mentioned, countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Turkey and others who simply have never done anything whatsoever when we have seen brutality in the past, why now? Well, I, I suspect that they have come to the conclusion, at least the Saudis have, that ISIS will have greater luck working among their own population to recruit supporters than inside of Iran. They may be on the border with Iran and they may be threatening Iran, but there aren't going to be many converters in Iran to the ISIS, into the ISIS fold. But there's a large portion of people in Saudi Arabia unhappy with the royal family there. These would be possibly willing converts to ISIS, and the Saudis recognize they're, better, they're going to have to get out after them and quickly. Is it not fair to say, though, when we're talking about these countries, that a lot of money has been funneled into ISIS from, and again, I'm going to mention them, and please tell me if I have too few here, but certainly Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey? Well, of course, there's a struggle going on in the Middle East, and that is a Sunni-Shia struggle, and that the governments that you have mentioned as Sunni governments have been supporting militants on the ground. But I think as they did support al-Qaeda years before, this thing has gotten out of hand now, and it may have they, they may have given birth to some sort of Frankenstein that they're going to have to act against, at is, least some of them. Is we'll there, have to see about the Qataris. Is there anything working here behind the scenes with America? Because as soon as the first thing, when you said to me that Saudi Arabia is now going against these groups, for whatever reason, I just started to think about economy, oil, America, and other influences that we just don't see. Well, I think that, that the... Uh, Hopefully, our diplomatic service, I suspect, and our, our security services are talking to these governments. But I think that we need to go back a bit, and we go back to 1991, where we had a threat from Saddam Hussein, and we need to look at what George Herbert Walker Bush did. He mobilized the world against Saddam. We need to mobilize this region against ISIS 
But what we also need to do that George Herbert Walker Bush did is we need to get these countries to carry part of the burden. We need our military operations paid for by Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the UAE. They need to fund our operations in full. That's what George Herbert Walker Bush did in 1991, leaving us no debt. This is something his son failed to do in, in the war on terror starting in 2001. While these countries have come out against ISIS at this point, is there any reason for us to believe sitting here right now that they would take a more active role, be it militarily, be it monetarily, in funding anything against ISIS, keeping in mind all the religious factions here, and that certainly always deals in their decisions? Well, when the Grand Mufti, the senior most religious uh, theologian in Saudi Arabia, comes out and calls him enemy number one, that looks like a sign to me that the Saudis are going to be in this with us. Now let's look at the James Foley case here. This is just tragic and it certainly is brutal. We've seen these sort of things before. In your opinion, what is ISIS hoping to gain here? Because certainly they know that America won't negotiate with them. Are they simply doing this to draw America further into the conflict? It's intimidation. They, they know that there are a lot of people in the United States, of course, that, that don't want to be involved in any kind of conflict at any time. And this is sheer use of terror against civilian populations, our own population, and anyone else who opposes them. When ISIS entered Iraq, a small number of these guys, like 3,000 of them, defeated 20,000 members of the Iraqi army. They fled. The uh, Three divisions of Iraqi soldiers fled because they were terrorized, what they had seen on the video. They won't be terrorizing American forces, I can assure you, but this is part of the playbook to make themselves look larger than life, more dangerous than anyone else. And, and, and more willing to extract violence against us. We're going to have to toughen up our lips and go after these guys and go after them hard. Was this part of the playbook pushed forward because of the airstrikes and any success they had? Surely. Surely. When we look then at what comes next, question I asked a couple of minutes ago, the president has now come out and said that, of course, we're appalled by what has happened here. You've told us first here what's happening in that region right now with Saudi Arabia. But what is actually physically next for the United States that they're not doing? Well, the United States did increase the number of airstrikes. And there were 36 airstrikes around the dam, which supported. So the president is gearing things up. The DOD is gearing things up. As you stated earlier, uh, the, there are, is an increase, uh, or the uh, Newsmax just stated, the Department of Defense has announced the increase in troops out there. We're going to have to ultimately have some boots on the ground, not a large number, we want some special operations folks out there because once we go beyond the operations around the dam and into cities that where they have to be removed, we're going to need a lot. It's going to be a lot more complicated, these types of operations. And you're going to need U.S. forces closer to the ground interfacing with Iraqis, Kurds and others. Let's go ahead and just get down here to this, this boots on the ground issue and, and pick this apart just a little bit. And I want to find out exactly what your thinking is. Are we talking about a military force here? Are we talking about an actual fighting force? Or are we talking about a force that is prepared to fight but is simply there on the ground to laze the targets and to basically do the intelligence that would lead the airstrikes to further success? It's exactly what you just stated. You'll want some special forces teams, some agency people or whatever, some combination of special operations forces that interact with larger indigenous forces that do the intelligence, the lazings, and the communications. The SF teams will provide some logistical support and some muscle to protect those teams, but what you just explained is exactly what we need. How many people would that take, in your opinion? What do we got to put on the ground? Not more than 200. Not more than 200, but will they all be in one area of the country? We're talking about the no, northern portion small, of the country? They would be in teams working with different indigenous groups. Some may be with the Iraqi, with the Iraqi army, some may be with the Kurds. Others may be with other groups that are developed. Knowing what you know from the CIA and governments, is it possible that there are people already on the ground doing this whom we don't know about at this point? Could be possible. So what then comes for the president here next? Do we then go out and start to actually get together with Saudi Arabia? Are we talking about some sort of a meeting here? What happens now that we've heard this? I suspect that the that this Department of State, we have an ambassador there, and a full staff of competent people in Saudi Arabia and all the governments in the region. We've got to have to bring all of these folks together and, 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 and form a long-term plan to degrade and destroy ISIS. And to the point you made earlier, is it now at the point where Americans more than ever before have to commit themselves? And if we're going to be honest here, say, 
we have to commit ourselves to killing these people as quickly as possible. Exactly right. We are going to have to commit ourselves to the hard task ahead, which will be making war on ISIS, destroying them as a force and eliminating them. Gary, it's always a pleasure to get a chance to talk to you. Please be safe. We'll look forward to you coming home soon. Thank you. All right, that story and, of course, a whole lot more we're going to continue to follow right here on Newsmax. But that is what he says and what many others say. America must be prepared to kill the enemy. All right, coming up later in the show, a dog in Chile has a bone to pick with a car. The dog did not fare well. After the break, race relations in America. Some African-American leaders say President Obama appears to care more about immigration than the African-American community. That and more when Midpoint continues.